You are listening to Fika with Vicky on United Public Radio, 107.7 and 105.3 from New Orleans. everyone, and welcome to FICA. Our guest today is author Brad Smith. Brad has written 14 novels so far, including The Return of Kid Cooper, which won a Spur Award, Red Means Run, which was among bookless best crime novels for 2012, and and both One-Eyed Jacks and Copperhead Road, which was shortlisted for the Dashiell Hammett Award. But most importantly, I me was enamored of both Copperhead Road and the Goliath Run, which we'll be focusing on today. When it comes to experiences, Brad's been there, done that, and moved on to doing more. To give you an idea of what I'm talking about, he worked for as in the signal department of the Canadian National Railway and then moved on to a project, a railway project in Africa. He's also been a bartender, truck driver, farmer, teacher, carpenter, and I can't remember everything else. But yes, when it comes to writing, you know Brad has a lot to draw from, leaving us with layered characters and stories that come from the heart. Because you can tell that Brad loves writing, even though he admits it's hard work. So thank you for working hard to create such memorable reading moments, Brad, and welcome to Fika. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for having me, Vicki. We always start with this. (laughs) I'm sorry if it's monotonous audience, but it has to be done. Can you tell us a little bit about those two novels so that people have an idea of what we're speaking about? Okay. Um, Chronologically, I'll start with Goliath. It came out first. Um, The Goliath Run is a contemporary piece. It takes place in the U.S. And it begins with a school shooting, uh, which is typical down there, a terrible, horrible event. And that's sort of the catalyst for what happens. Uh, One of the protagonists is a woman named Jo, and her goddaughter was actually killed in the shooting. And she is, of course, beyond uh, grief. Uh, There's a local, or, or there's a, a guy who's uh, on the radio, he's a, he's a media type, kind of a Fox News type of guy who tells a lot of things on his show that aren't true. And he ends up attacking the parents of the kids for the kids being killed. And our our protagonist, Joe, becomes so outraged by what he's saying every day. Very similar to a certain person in the States who was going around telling people that the, the shooting at Sandy Hook never even happened, you know. Uh she became so outraged by this that she did not know where to turn and eventually she came up with a solution and she kidnapped the radio host's own daughter to teach him a lesson so it's about it's kind of a combination a uh, procedural where they're trying to track her down with the kidnapped child and he's fighting against her but still pushing his lies on the radio and i don't want to tell you too much but i don't want to get any spoilers involved but that's the, ju- the juxtaposition of the of the two characters, anyway. <clears throat> uh, so it is considered a crime. Oh. It is considered a crime novel. There is investigation in that as work, as well as the background story. Yeah, the investigation is probably 50-50 with the background story and the character stuff, and it's um, there's some FBI agents and also local police that are trying to track her down. And she's a very very smart woman, and she stays one jump ahead of them all the way through. Copperhead Road, we got to go back about 90 years. Um, It takes place during the Great Depression in Appalachia. And um, it's about a place, the the Flagg family, who have been manufacturing molasses down there since before the Civil War. And it takes place in 1936. And like everything else in the 1930s, there was no business happening. There, There was no market for molasses because nobody had any money to buy anything. And the daughter of the Flagg family comes home. She uh, loses her job in Chicago. And when she realizes that the the family's not making any money anymore, she stumbles upon this old guy who's making moonshine in his backyard and finds out what you can get for a gallon of moonshine. 
So she has this eureka idea that they're going to start manufacturing moonshine in the old molasses plant. Um, they hired this fella. He's a black man from the backwoods to teach them how to make it. But they have no idea how to how to ship it and market it. And when they try to, the bad guys um, end up pulling their trucks over and beating up the drivers and taking the moonshine away from them. So she ends up finding a guy named Bobby Barlow, who's a local. He's a bit of a, a ne'er-do-well to a certain extent. He's, he's been in and out of jail a couple of times, but he's a complete car guy. And he, all he cares about is racing cars. And this is in the fledging, fledgling days of uh, stock car racing when they would basically race in a farmer's field on a Saturday night. And you might win five bucks for winning. So she decides that he's the guy she needs to build her a fast car and transport her moonshine to the various markets around. So it's kind of about the, the uh, relationship between the two of them and also of the, the two of them staying ahead of the, uh, the cops known as the revenueers back then. And there's a local crime family that's also a, a very uh, bad group of people that they have to stay ahead of too. So it has that Bonnie and Clyde vibe. Um, and and I love it. I love reading about that era. I love I loved Goliath's run, but if I were to go to a bookstore and look at a book, I would just look at the cover of that book and bring it home. And it yeah. did not disappoint. Copperhead Copperhead Road is um and I, I want to go on to read your other novels, but I'm definitely just reading that made me a fan right off the bat. And well, thank you. Thank you and much. Goliath Run is just well. These sound like two very different books, different eras, different um, times, locations, and yet they feel the same to me because they're both about people when the outside world, outside actions um, change their actions, how they would normally live. Um, I'm sure that um, Ava's family was very God-fearing. Um, you know, they would never think to break the law before the depression and people were going hungry in their, in their neighborhood. And Joe was pushed to, um, things that she would never normally have done if, if her goddaughter had not, um, not been killed. So you are the man behind these words. <laughs> Do you feel that, um, and, and it, and it, there, there was growth that came from these things happening all the way around. They, they, they did things that they normally wouldn't do, and it changed them and the lives around them. Do you think that um, that rules weren't always there not to be broken, and that justice, our idea of justice, the book idea of justice, is kind of murky sometimes, depending on the circumstances? Yeah, I, I definitely think it's murky, and I the line that I love that I stole for it's on the front of the page front page of a copperhead road is from Bob Dylan to live outside the law. You must be honest. And I think that's, you know, I'm not advocating that kidnapping or breaking moonshine, but it goes back even to the days of Robin hood. You know, Robin hood is a perfect example. I was going yeah. <laughs> saying Robin hood, Robin hood. Go ahead. Yeah. So we, <laughs> we, we don't know how much of the Robin hood myth is true maybe he didn't steal from the rich and give to the poor maybe he put it in his pocket but we love the idea of him stealing from the rich and in that case it wasn't just the rich he was stealing from the evil who were who were making people more downtrodden than they already were so there's something very romantic and very satisfying about that image about somebody giving them their cup come up and and if they have to break the law a little bit or bend the law a little bit for the good then i think that's okay and it makes for it can make for a good story, you know. <clears throat> it does. Now, first of all, Robin Hood did steal from the rich and give to the poor. He is a personal hero. <laughs> I said, I've done several shows where people with Robin Hood backgrounds have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have I've walked in. So, but yes, all the time I was reading, I'm like, do I dare say this is like Robin Hood? Will he get upset if I say Robin Hood? But then you said it, Brad, and it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are Ava, Joe, these, these are very strong women, not in, you know, sometimes you see strong women in the armor straight from a video game. <laughs> 
<laughs> with superpowers and, and that strength. But we're talking strength of convince, conviction, strength to do what they had to do for the people around them. Just intelligent, as you said, there, Joe, like they really think about what they're doing. Um why are you compelled to write strong women like is there a reason you chose to do that um or are there models like um i've always wondered you see you see it a lot in film even nowadays maybe a little bit less but it seemed like so often you go to see a movie and the, and the woman the actress is just a placeholder she's a wife or a girlfriend or a mother or something like that and she doesn't really have any job and the, and the guys are driving the bus right and that's not true throughout history. It's not true right now. And it's it's not true throughout history either. When if you just look back and take any random list of women with you know, Delano Roosevelt or in Canada, Susanna Moody or Harriet Tubman, who's got a connection to our area here. I mean, this has been going on forever. And it's it's always puzzled me why they haven't really gotten a bigger stage, you know, a, a bigger spotlight. Because um, and I think that there were when they're independent and super smart and, and very savvy, like Ava and Joe are, they're just much, much more interesting. And that they can make the counterpart more interesting too. But in Copperhead Road, for instance, uh, Ava's counterpart is Bobby, who's a savant-like guy when it comes to cars, but he's not as smart as Ava. I mean, and he knows he's not as smart as Ava, which is pretty cool. Well, Ava has some things going for her. She left the area for a while, so bringing back new things always um, helps. And at that time, she grew up in her father was a minister. And, you know, there was a lot more reading and stuff going on in those households, I think, with the Bible and, and stuff. So, so she would have a leg up there. But speaking of Bobby... <laughs> Poor dear Bobby. Uh, <laughs> we look at him and we say that. We say, that Bobby ain't so smart. But that Bobby could rip apart a car and put it back together like nobody's business. And who else knows what else he would have done if given if given um, the opportunity. So, you know, we often as a society look at people because of their accent or their country of origin or, you know, even the poverty, um, which, you know, Bobby had a lot going against him in, in those ways and judge them as not being as intelligent or, right. you know, that class system um, um, happens. Was this you, um, making comment upon that? Because the same kind of thing happens in, in, there's that same kind of idea in, um, Goliath's run, um, with, with that class system and we're better and whatever. Well, Bobby, I think it's a compliment to call, to say that somebody is very simple. You know, it sounds it sounds like an insult. No, no, I get you. <laughs> yeah, and, and and Bobby is a very simple guy. He, his whole life, for instance, he went and served during World War One, and when he came back, he had you know that to deal with. But it, his whole life has been very kind of straight ahead, and he, he's not complicated in, in any way, really. And he's had his his problems. Like I say, he's he's been in and out of jail a couple of times, but he but he's not you know some sort of a uh, mastermind of anything he just he just living his life and he's a very simple guy in the best way and and maybe meeting ava brings out a little more in him about not so much of what's right or right and wrong but about he's kind of pushed into an area where he may have not had entered on by himself you know like after i don't want to tell too much but after ava, i know it's hard <laughs> yeah after after ava bails him out of jail the first time and he kind of sees what's going on um he kind of he changes a little bit but he doesn't change a lot you know his his morals are the same and his tunnel vision is kind of the same he's more excited about building them a, a fast car than he is about the the moral aspect of selling moonshine because building fast cars is what he loves to do so it's it could be that it's not just Ava, but he has a goal. 
Like he has a goal yeah. and a possibility of reaching that goal because the finances are being. Yeah. So he is Leonard Skinner's simple man. <laughs> right yeah, there. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> they wrote that's the, the first, song. That's, that's the first time somebody's come up with that. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I love that song. So yes. <laughs> it happens. Okay. We have a question from author Brian Greener. Um, perhaps a better description of Bobby might be uncomplicated rather than simple. Well, we've already, I should have got that question before. <laughs> <laughs> We're going with simple, Brian. <laughs> but I hear what you're saying. We, this is the problem with language and how it, there are so many words that society, that are lovely words, but society has given them a negative type of meaning, right? Like, yes. yeah. so, so yes, but um, we are now very positive about Bobby being simple. I'll, I'll do that. Or, or uncomplicated. <laughs> or uncomplicated. <laughs> it's okay. Brian and I <laughs> have disagreements all the time. <laughs> well, tell, tell Brian he can offer any advice, any, any suggestions are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Allergies again. But there's definitely that class system thing happening in both of these books. Um, yeah. Do you look into that often with your with the other books? I haven't had a chance to read them all yet. Yeah, I think um, I think there's probably a common theme. Like e even in uh, even in, in Goliath Run, the the cop, the New York cop Bell, he's be, he's being looked down upon by the FBI. Mm -hmm. So there's there's that too, which is kind of a, a sub story, but but it's it's very much there, and they just they don't consider him to be a real cop because they're FBI, right? And as it turns out, again, we don't want to say too much. He outsmarts all the FBI. Agents. Well, yes, yes. Yeah. We need. I sometimes think we need to do a show and then have make everybody read the books and then do a second show <laughs> where we can actually get into the characters and things because this drives me it drives me crazy um so copperhead road more than i mean it was it's a historical crime fiction you've gone to another place another time how much time did you put into researching for that unfortunately i never usually i would jump in the car and go there like i, I wrote a book that took place in gettysburg and i would jump in the car and go there it's like six hour drive this was right in the middle of covid so I couldn't get across the border, but the wonders of Google and and all kinds and kinds of books. I, I there's a great book I, I should I should have it here for you right now. It's called Driving with the Devil, that uh, that, that really dealt in, in in great depths about the the early stock car drive races and stuff down there. And that that was the other thing that I that really made me get into this book to begin with is because I I always knew. That some of the early stock car drivers, like I said, that were driving around the farmer's field in their dad's pickup truck or whatever, um, they became, they were guys who used to run moonshine who became stock car drivers. But until I started, until I started researching it, I didn't realize that worked both ways. The moonshine runners were going to the racetracks and saying, okay, that guy there, he's the best driver here. They would recruit him to come and work for them. And back then, of course, everybody was so broke. If you could make an extra two bucks on a Saturday night running moonshine or five bucks or whatever, you would do it. So this is, and of course, the whole stock car thing became the, the juggernaut known as NASCAR today, which is a multi-billion dollar thing. But this is really back in the really raw roots of the of the, of the, the sport, you know, where if, if you had a $50 car, you could be a stock car driver. Nowadays, you can get a million dollar car. Well, I remember... So, um, no, I was going to say when it comes to car prices, like even when I was young, I think my father picked my first car up for like 50 bucks at a Wreckers and, and say he did. So things have come from those prices really fast. Yeah, when I was a kid, when we were 14, we started driving when we were like 14, not a, not on the road, but my buddy had a, about a 30 acre farm outside of little village Canfield. And we bought several cars, and I don't think we ever paid more than thirty bucks. We bought one for ten bucks and one for twenty bucks, and we would we had our own track in the field, and we would just 
run those cars hard. But by the time we turned 16, we, we kind of knew how to drive, you know? <laughs> we, so, you, so this was a natural for you to write this book. And yeah. with that as the basis, as well as you own your own 1936 Ford Coupe. Yeah, mine's actually a 37. Oh, is it a 37? Okay. Yeah, yeah, they're very similar to, to the to the untutored eye. You wouldn't know the difference. Yeah, so my my car is basically very much like the car that Bobby builds in the in the in the book. Yeah, and my my dad used to he used to race cars too. He used to st uh, race at the drag strip near here. And when he was when I was a little kid, he had a 37 Ford Coupe. Now, would you race? this car or is it too much of a baby like <laughs> it's not a baby but i don't race it no i've got <laughs> i've got a couple cars i've got a 68 mustang too which is if you if you know the movie bullet with steve mcqueen mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the mustang this is one of the most famous car chases ever i have a pretty similar car to that except mine's not green uh my my coupe has got old paint on it it was last painted 60 years ago or something <clears throat> but I rebuilt a flathead engine like we like I used in uh, Copperhead Road, and I, I spruced it up a bit. I put two carbs on it and dual exhaust and stuff like that. But it's it's just for it's a pleasure car for just driving around. It's not a race car. And no, no. So you were, and that was driving with the devil. It's about the history of NASCAR and those things. Yeah, it's a terrific book. Yeah, like some some of those guys. Some of those guys down there were just unbelievable. There, there was one guy named Roy Hall, and there's a there's a, a song by Jim Croce called uh, "Rapid Roy," that stock uh, that stock car boy. If you look it up later, and he was wanted by the law most of his life, but he was still racing on the weekends. And a, a couple of times, he dressed up as a woman and raced, so the cops wouldn't recognize him. <laughs> So he's, yeah, no, they, well, they would all be quite notorious um, in their areas of, you know, oh, yeah. we, it, would, yeah. it would, can you imagine if that was going on now with all the news and that, you know, when yeah. so-and-so is off and people would be cheering for them or the, yeah. <laughs> or the cops? And getting back to your earlier comment, I, I, when I stumbled across that, I thought it was really interesting that they allowed women to race back in the 30s. Because I just thought that it was all men. You know, I think that there was a big diff. Like growing up, um, out in the rural area, um, here we didn't actually have a farm, but I would go to the friends of of a farm um, that had farms, mm -hmm. and watch their mums, and they did everything, everything, grow the garden. And people did not mess with them, okay? <laughs> they had their own power. And yeah. I sometimes think that in rural areas, um, the women had to do more, um, not that, it's, uh, anyways, the point was in rural areas, they sort of have their own ruling. And if it needs to get done, it gets done regardless of, you, regardless yeah, probably, of, of who. And probably if you dug into it deep enough, there were a lot of cases when the, the women did a lot more than the men, <laughs> depending on the man himself. You know what I mean? Oh, hallelujah, bro. <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah. Yeah. Um, no, but they did a lot. So when, so, and that is something that people I, don't, you have to sort of live that to really see it happening. The power that was theirs because yeah. their jobs were just as important as that time. They weren't considered. And they, yeah. And they found you, you found like, I was the same as you. I grew up in a little village of a hundred and some people, but uh, surrounded by farms. And most of my friends lived on farms. So I would spend go overnight on the farm, stuff like that. And you're right. Their mothers could, I mean, they just weren't making the oatmeal in the morning and doing the ironing. They were out in the barn doing the chores. And they, if there was wiring problems or electrical problems, plumbing or whatever, they could chip in and do it all, you know, because you didn't you didn't phone up a plumber or electrician in those days, you know. Do it yourself was a religion, okay? You weren't going yeah. to give somebody else money to do something that you were capable of doing yourself. That philosophy still causes me... <laughs> Yeah, well, like I, people ask me about what I know about cars and stuff, and like I can say, I've got some more cars. And I always said, when I grew up, uh, if my, if I was if my car, if the starter went out of my car and I took it to the garage to have it replaced, my dad would have disowned me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought 
<laughs> no. yeah, yeah. Okay, enough. Okay, we were supposed to be talking about the book, but I just have to say, when I was older and I started working, I went and bought a newer car. It wasn't brand new. It was, <laughs> but it was a newer car. I spent more than any of it because I was tired of seeing my dad under the car in the cold winter. He was getting older fixing the car, right? Like I just wanted something where they didn't say it's okay. Just take it easy when I pulled it out of the driveway. <laughs> Oh my goodness, I created the havoc that I created by just buying this car and, and paying this money was, yeah, yeah no, you, you got to live it. So, <laughs> so when I read yeah. these books, when I read that, it's almost like, even though that was way before, but not as far as I'd like it to be, but it, <laughs> it, <laughs> it really feels like home. You know what I mean? It's not like. Yeah. We were moonshining out back, but there's something about it that just pulls you in a familiarity that is, I don't know, almost and I instinctive. Like, I like the little authentic moments. You, you, you and I, we talked a little bit about Steinbeck when we were off the air um, in Cannery Road. Do you remember when Mac, I know you remember this because you were Steinbeck then, when Mac and the boys go to get the frogs? Oh, yes. And they, yeah. And they, bought, they borrow the Model T truck and they back it up the hill. Well, they have to back it up the hill because this, the transmission bands are so worn that they, they, they won't go up in, in, in forward gear. But that's such a nice little thing. And you can tell that, that John Steinbeck knows exactly what it was like to drive a Model T Ford. Yes. No, those yeah. those little details are important in writing. And I think exactly. that's why I was drawn to him. The, that, that feeling of the rural, the gritty, the making it work. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, but we'll get, okay, so Brian's back with all your books, books seem quite serious in tone. Do you ever, as a writer, feel the urge to try something else, such as a light comedy or other genres? Um, I don't know what books Brian has read, so I can't comment too much on this, but there's, I've been, I've been told that my books all have a fair amount of humor in them. Uh, so uh, maybe yeah. Goliath, Goliath, maybe not as much because the, I mean, when you start with a school shooting, you can't get too late. But uh, Kid Cooper, Red Means Run, uh, Busted Flush. Um, I've been I was nominated for the the Arthur Ellis Award. Well, uh, yeah. So yeah, I I think I think they I, my books do have a fair amount of humor. They they cover they cover um, life. So just in life, there's. There's humor as well as as the dark side. I'm thinking um, Copper Copperhead Road was was I mean its humor was just about life, right? Like things that happen that you can. It was it was it was pretty serious. Well, the ba but, the baseball the baseball stuff was yeah yeah <laughs> was, meant, was meant, meant to be funny. You know? yeah, no no so. no that was that was. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's just a, it's just a mixture. But I know I haven't read it yet. But in reading the synopsis for Hats Off, which you wrote the screen was made into a movie, um, all, hat. all hat, all hat, right? Yeah. Um, because yes, because they're all hat and no cows, right? <laughs> all hat, <laughs> no cattle, all hat and no cattle. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. So that is supposed to be a lighthearted. Um, movie with its with its with with its funny moments and so therefore i, I feel that the book is yeah. we have to read more brian we have to read more <laughs> dave asks i should read um oh. i do know i i know a little bit about this there's a place um not too far from me about 10 miles up the lake um there's a place called austin's park and the owner of Austin's Park, believe it or not, his name was Park Austin. And his his daughter is a good friend of mine, and his and his uh, his grandkids are good friends of mine. And they they had he had stories about rescuing some moonshiners off of Lake Erie at once. And there, there's been a couple of good books written about the guys that ran booze across Lake Ontario. There was a guy from from Hamilton named Ben Kerr, and I think the book was called Whiskey and Ice. And it's it was a it's a very interesting book if you can find a copy of it. Ben Kerr ended up owning the Hamilton Tigers, which were an NHL team at the time. Tigers, not not uh, football. 
and they actually played out here in Dungo. I guess the Dungo Mudcats were kind of a iconic team. If you're from this area, you probably heard of the Mudcats. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. So um, I don't know a lot about it, Dave, but I have heard quite a bit about it because, as as you know, prohibition was lifted earlier in Canada than it was in the U.S., which opened up. Uh, Oh yeah. Big, yeah, big, big, yeah. big business. Um, and Hamilton had quite a crime scene for a while. I just, I'm just going to read the question for those because on the radio or whatever, who okay. can't see the question. Um, Dave was just asking Brad if he ever thought about writing a book about the moonshiners running across Lake Erie in boats, not in cars. So that's what we were talking about. Oh, he corrected himself. Robin... Good morning, Vicky and Brad. He's out west. What's wondering, Brad? What inspired you to write about mysteries, crime, and such? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I really didn't sit down to be a crime writer, and I don't know um, what really what really identifies a crime writer. I just I, I feel like I, I write character pieces, character studies, and I guess I was drawn into that aspect of things because. I, I, it might be more interesting to write about a, a bank robber than a guy who, you know, delivers mail for a living. Uh, so I think One Eye Jacks was an early book, and it was about a boxer who was just trying to get some money to buy his family farm back or to save his family farm from the, from the creditors. So it didn't really start out to be a crime novel per se, but it, I guess it kind of morphed into a crime novel because of the people he ran into trying to raise the money. And the same, I guess Copperhead Road, basically, because of the moonshine thing, was going to be a crime novel all along. But it was more like I, I just, I'm just interested in character studies. And um, I heard Len, Elmore Leonard talk one time. I had a chance to talk to Elmore Leonard once on the phone. But I, I heard him in a separate interview, and uh, they asked him how he, <clears throat> what he, what he had to start a novel. And he said the only thing he knew when he started a new book was what the protagonist did for a living. And I thought that was pretty um, interesting and hard to believe, to tell you the truth, but he had no reason to to make that up. So, yeah, he, he would start writing a book when he all he knew was what his protagonist did. And, and which brings us to, I mean, your books are fast paced. They, <clears throat> they, you know, the characters there, the actions there, it goes until it ends. Um, so I can see you just sitting down and start typing. <laughs> That's how I yeah. picture you writing. But is that how you write? Or do you plot a lot before getting in there? No, I, I've never done. You, and I always say, I always preface this by saying there's no right way or wrong way. To oh, no, no. We have writers of all, but it's always yeah. interesting. I would say you can write one page a day for 300 days if you want. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. But but, I, but I've heard of people who have Bristol boards on the wall, you know, laying out where everything was going. And usually when I start a book, I know the beginning and the middle and the end, but I don't know all the details. And sometimes I don't know a lot of the details, but I've never really wanted to do a really intricate outline because I feel like it would take away from the spontaneity of things. Every, every book I've ever written, there's been a character who has surprised me to a certain extent. So it's, it's not accurate to say that they write themselves because that's kind of bull, but they kind of reveal themselves to you, you know? And so if I had a, a, a very spec specific outline, I might lose that. I might just say, okay, this guy here is only going to be this or whatever. So I've never wanted to, and it's worked okay for me so far, um, just knowing the beginning and the middle and the end type thing. And then once you start writing, it kind of fills itself in, you know. And, of course, when you start rewriting, that's when it really gets better too, you know. So you've, you've said that it's hard work. I mean, it's one of the the hardest jobs you've ever done. It's about sitting there every day and doing it. That's where the discipline comes in. Not just having the dream, but sitting there and doing that work. Do you, yeah. how did you gain the discipline to do that? Do you have any suggestions for other people out there? Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing because that, yeah, it's absolutely the toughest thing. And with me, it, it was at some point, I told myself that I had to prove that I could do this. And so it was like a challenge. So I couldn't allow myself to fail. And once and once I published the first book, it, it, 
I, then I, I was going to say it got easier. It didn't necessarily get easier because working is uh, Dorothy Parker said, I hate writing, but I love having written. Um, I don't I don't feel that strongly to say I hate writing, <clears throat> but I know exactly what she's talking about. I love having written. Uh, so once but once you kind of get into the groove and tell yourself, OK, this is what I have to do. And, I, and with me, I, I make myself do X amount every day because if I let it slip and let it slip, then it wouldn't happen. But again, I mean, that's different for everybody, you know, like some, so some you, people, oh. some people start writing it. If they're maybe they might have kids at home, they start writing at 10 or 11 at night, you know, and I, I could never do that. I don't think I was right in the morning. Uh, so you but, find it best to, I was going to ask you that, but you find it best to do it always at a certain point. Like that's a part of your schedule. That's I'm sitting down and I'm doing this now. Yeah, and and when people sometimes they hear me do this, say this in an interview, and they they envision me writing 365 days a year. Well, that's not true, you know. When I'm when I'm working on a, a first draft, I'm working for usually it takes me three or four months or whatever, and then usually I set it aside, <clears throat> and then I go back into it, or I might show it to a, a person or maybe a couple of people. Uh, but yeah, I'm not writing 365, and I'm not sweating over a computer every day for hours on end, you know. Well, you just ruined that image. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Sorry. No, no, no. Oh, I know, but no, no. So you write for some time, take some time off, go about your life, and then. Or I have another to... project on the go. I do some screenwriting and stuff, so I, I might move on to a different project or, or whatever. And uh... so that's still ongoing. It wasn't just something that you did and you're moving on. You're still enjoying screenwriting and you're still working at it. Yeah, I recently finished a. a a rewrite about, about a baseball movie actually and i can't say too much about it but it's it's finished now and it's kind of making the rounds so uh it's not it's not one of my books it's, it's not an adaptation but i've adapted a couple of my books and uh there's a couple of them have been under option right now red means run is under option right now to a canadian uh company um so yeah there's always i'm sort of on the periphery of, of screenwriting but movies nowadays they seem to have and to some extent passed me by a little bit. I'm, I'm kind of in love with the movies of the 1970s, for instance, with, with the golden age of movie making with, you know, The Godfather and Cuckoo's Nest and so many great movies. And nowadays there's so much stuff is post-apocalyptic, which is fine if you're into that, or it's Marvel comics or it's uh, horror. And it's just a lot of, and it's a lot of really big budget, like crazy budget stuff. With in, a lot of stuff. In, but indies are making a pull in, with, yeah. with the way the world is and with computers and that it's opening up and there's a lot more indies going out there. And I think with that, we'll see more of that, you know, that kind but of thing. But they're harder to make too, you know? It's yeah. Yeah. Get, no, getting, get the getting the back. producers and getting the money yeah. is, is, is difficult to do. Yeah. Um, but there is hope. There There's is hope. always yeah, hope. I, I, I agree. I hope you're right. <laughs> okay. Nancy would like to know, hello, Nancy. What are you working on now? Uh, I want to know that too. I have, I have two projects right now. Well, three counting the movie thing. But um, I have a book that's done. It's not coming out until next year. Um, and it's for Brian, it is lighter. It's it's almost a political satire, and it's it's about it's back. It takes place in Ontario. I haven't set a book in Ontario for a while, and it's it's about a small city similar to Hamilton, and it's mostly about the green belt situation here, and uh, it's it's very fluid because of the green belt situation, which has been kind of a movable feast for the last few months, as you know. And it's about a guy, a baseball player. This is kind of my baseball novel. I've never really written a baseball novel. I'm a huge baseball fan. It's about a guy who, who's a baseball player who's kind of forced into running for office in order to keep his job because the owner of the team wants to split the, the vote in order to get his guy in. So that's coming out next year. It's called Billy Crawford's Greatest Run. Uh, that book is done. And getting back to moonshine for some reason, I was I was doing some research about the city of Moose Jaw. And I don't know how much you know about Moose Jaw, but they used to call it Little Chicago. Um, and now I know why, because <laughs> it was a crazy place in the 1920s, and the, the population was only like 25,000 people, but it was 
uh, brothels, speakeasies, gambling dens, all along a place called River Street, which is the oldest part of the city. And there was rumors that Al Capone used to travel there to buy booze and to hide out and stuff like that. So I've sort of, and this has got a more of a lighthearted thing too, I've sort of created a book around that. And it's not about moonshine like Copperhead Road is, it's more about the characters and revolving around us. And it's just such a, it's a really fascinating, um, it's just a fascinating town when you think about where it was and when it was, you know, in the middle of the Canadian prairies, you know, you didn't expect to find that. No, no. And it, it's interesting. I mean, that's, that's what it is. You, you learn you, about something and then you think, what if, yeah. what if this happened yeah. or that happened? That's the, that's no, I went through your list of jobs. Um, and, um, I have to say, it's pretty impressive for a writer to have. I mean, you have tons of experience. You were out there doing it. I wonder how much Steinbeck had to do with that, <laughs> that lifestyle. Or, or, or maybe maybe it's just I couldn't hold down a job. <laughs> no, no, but I'm not seeing that. Why? Why are you being... <laughs> <laughs> um why are you no i i i can see that as as i pointed out at one point in time um, i too put a typewriter in my trunk and was going um and was having a very good time till my husband came along no i love you guy um, <laughs> i had a friend stand in the driveway saying i blame steinbeck for this <laughs> 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 So I can see that, but okay. So then there's the question: Was it just that you couldn't keep down a job? And you had to keep moving on, or did you? I mean, you wanted to write forever. So did you have that thought that this would all to live an eclectic life to get those experiences? No, I didn't. I wasn't that calculated. It, it maybe subconsciously a little bit, but it really wasn't that calculated. I just I really liked to travel when I was young. I'm more of a homebody now. Uh, but I ended up in Texas and Alberta and Africa and wherever. Um, and wherever I went, because I had so many jobs because I would go somewhere and I need money. So it was only so if I could get a job as a roofer or a bartender or, or whatever, I would do that. I mean, it, and it served me well because it got to the point where I could do a lot of things. Um, and you're right. It, it, it definitely served me well in terms of uh, when I did start to write. But it was probably more than more than the job experiences with the different people that you meet, you know, because mm -hmm. you're, meeting pe you're meeting people from all walks of life, you know. Uh, and that's to me, that's probably the bigger thing than, than the jobs themselves, you know. Well, in your bio, you wrote about um, listening to the neighbors in those days, people talked across the fence or whatever listening to the neighbors listening to their stories these older guys that had been in um vimy ridge or or whatever mm -hmm. and in both of the books that i have read there is this um older gentleman uh guider if you will um that just sort of stays off the sides and gives you know um, opinions without having to be listened to or whatever. Do you think listening to the stories of older folks, seeing them as people and a life before you knew them had any influence on those characters? Yes. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I've always, uh, when I worked as a carpenter, whenever we worked for somebody who was of my dad's generation, for instance, I would always quiz them, ask them, you know, how long have you been in Canada? Where did your family come from? And, you know, whether they came from Ireland during the potato famine or Italy, whenever. And it's always been fascinating to me, just just in general, not and the same thing. It's not calculated around thinking oh, I'm going to use this. No, no, no. It's book. like watching, listening to a radio story. Or... Exactly. Exactly. And it's, I'm, I'm always interested in, in, in people's lives, where they come from, because especially nowadays when there's, there's people talk about immigrants a lot. You know, we're all immigrants here, and um, that really defines people, to, not always, but a lot of times it defines them. Um, if, if you think about the Donnelly family, you know, I'm sure you know about the Black Donnellys. That whole story, you know, it's about people shooting each other because they had rival stage lines. But when you dig into that, that story goes back to, to Ireland for mm -hmm. generations, you know, and the Orange Men and the Black Fit and all that. So, you know, there's always that backstory 
that you need to get into to find out what's going on now. You know, I always <clears throat> say you can't. One of the reasons I'm doing this show is to hear people's stories because you can't understand a person unless you understand their stories, the stories of where they came from, the stories that were there. The, and this goes many, many generations. Like, I, oh. I still believe there's a lot of families suffering troubles from World War One, World War Two. You know, people go without a dad, whatever. It just continues down, right? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you know walk a mile what's remember the song walk a mile in his shoes yeah that's that's very much what you're talking about and uh yeah yeah you, you can't you can't figure out the present unless unless you know about the past and it's not for blaming it's for it's for cause and effect this happened yeah. and that her i mean sometimes i like think we look back for um different reasons but if you looked back and thought oh those guys were crazy driving around those mountains like <laughs> You don't get it because you weren't there. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to clarify they were crazy driving around those mountains like that, but they had reason. Yeah. Um, they had reason and they didn't like being told what to do. Okay. This was an important aspect. Yeah, I mean, because there was a lot of, I'm Irish, so I'm allowed to say this. There was a lot of Irish people there and, and, Okay, I got myself in trouble, but you know, there's a tendency not to like to be told what to do because they had been. They came from a country where they were. Yeah. Well, the other thing about Copperhead Road is it was also work. There was no work. Right. Right. So if, if you wanted, if someone Excellent. offered you a job hauling moonshine to the next uh, hauler, that was a job. And and that and that goes. Um, back to the whole even um bobby being in jail a lot because because you did what you could to make money i mean bank robberies that was that was the heyday yeah. of bank robberies and things as well right because people needed yeah, to eat yeah and there were a lot of bank robbers in the 1930s yeah yeah like a lot and they were a lot of them were portrayed to be robin hoods but most of them weren't <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah. Not what I've seen with Bonnie and Clyde. You know, something starts out noble and then it just attracts the wrong kind of people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it definitely, it definitely does that. Okay, so you mentioned, um, so I'm not spoiling this. Luther was a man of color and um and he was basically running the show making the moonshine made the best and, and, and running and you can see how in that need everybody's roles became important people became the boss of their area other people bent over to their expertise like yes sir i'm going to go do what you say right now and all of those lines start to disappear and merge together because people have a goal and they're working Yes, it's, it's it's very democratic. Yes, and, uh, yes. Yeah, and and there's really very little mention of Luther's race uh, in the book. You know, there's a couple of derogatory terms from people that you would expect it from, but the rest of the time when he's involved with the Flag family and they're making they're making moonshine, everybody's an equal, and that shouldn't be a, a revelatory thing. But it's in the 1930s, it was. It was a bit, once again, taking the time into context. I think that's yeah. so important. We go over, um, <clears throat> like you said, you lived a Huckleberry Finn life growing up. Mm -hmm. And yet some people will look at um, that book and say, well, this is a horrible book. And yet, no, Mark Twain was speaking against that you know, the things that were happening. Um, he was just in a time where he had to do it in a satirical manner. He was far above his time. And so people have to remember, you have to take it in the context that it was um, at that time. Not saying that that is the best way to be, but that is what they knew and was. You're, you're preaching to the choir here because it, it drives me crazy when people and all of a sudden that Mark Twain is kind of out of favor. Mark Twain was shining a light on this stuff. And now he's being criticized for shining a light on it, you know. I mean, he was he was totally doing the right thing, in my opinion. But now all of a sudden it's kind of like like they don't want to teach to kill a mockingbird in school anymore because the the because of some of the language in there. 
But Harper Lee was doing the same thing. She was shining the light on Rachel. That was, and so there are books that are not read alouds. I call them not read aloud books. Yeah. Um, but you definitely learn a lot by yes. going there with them. But I have found someone, I think I'm going to see if they will come on the show about Mark Twain because it's gone too far. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, Hemingway called Huckleberry Finn the greatest American novel ever written. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't yeah. even nice for him to give a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially especially complimenting another writer. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what was that quote? Um, never show me your work. I'll either hate you because you have no talent or despise you because you're better than me. Or something like that. <laughs> well, probably the only reason he was complimentary towards Mark Twain is because they weren't contemporaries. If they were contemporaries, he probably wouldn't have said it. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, so, I am totally off track here. Um, so, how at least we talk about Steinbeck? How do you think he has affected your writing? Um, you know, your life. What do you think that that means to you? Because I mean, you are. You've said that you've read you read grapes of wrath every couple of years um you know he's definitely had an impact what would you say that would be um i think just because we had such similar backgrounds and that he was he was so actually to get back to hemingway again uh even though he, he and hemingway are very different hemingway said when you write something you can tell how much a person knows about something by what they leave out as opposed to what they put in. And that Steinbeck's writing was like that when he was writing, like taking the red pony or mice or men, mice and, and men, when he was writing about those little farms back then, you could tell that he lived that. I mean, you could tell what it was like in that bunkhouse. You could practically smell that bunkhouse, you know. The, the, the one guy was putting liniment on his legs and there was a dog that smelled and all that. And 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 without even, without overwriting it, he completely... He completely lets you know that he knew exactly what he was talking about, and he has, he has so many different different ways to do that. You look you look at Grapes of Wrath, how he went, especially early on. He went the first chapter would be about the people, and the second chapter there's a great scene in there where a turtle climbs up an escarpment or an embankment beside a road, and he gets a seed under him, and the truck hits the turtle, and he rolls over, and then the seed lands in the dirt somewhere, and it's going to sprout. Well, that's the whole second chapter, I think, about two pages. And then he goes back to the Joad family, the next, the next chapter, but he, he does it so well. And it's just like, it's like a painting basically. You know? No, no, I can see Hemingway saying that because regardless of what I say, I do. He was one of my favorite authors as well. I had a, <laughs> had a big thing for um, that whole group. Um, and the conciseness of writing, which I see in your writing as well. Um, sometimes I like flowery, but in general, I will I will go for like just to the point. This is, yeah. you know, I think I the think cutting that, is is important. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons that nowadays I like Hemingway's short stories better than his novels. And he only wrote what five novels, and I still think his first novel I don't count. Torrance of Spring, uh, The Sun Also Rises, <clears throat> I think is his strongest book. But when you get back into his short stories, especially the, some of those really short stories that are like two pages long, they're just, they're brilliant, you know? And I, I really think there is the strongest work. Yeah, no, no, I can see where you're, where you're where, coming from. Where, where Steinbeck, I mean, The Red Pony and A Mice and Men in Cannery Row are very, Tortilla Flat are very short books. But his masterpiece, The Grapes of Wrath, is a very long book, but he did both equally as well, you know. Well, we don't give short stories enough credit. I'm really getting into them more so now. Um, we just think short stories, but as you know, I've learned from talking to different authors and that they can be more complicated because you have to do it all in such a few words. Yeah. That and, becomes the and keep in mind that one of the best short story writers in the world is a Canadian. Alice okay, Monroe. I'm gonna take a chance. Alice Monroe, yes. 
yeah. you can see her. I did a show with a friend on Alice Monroe because, and once again, it takes me back to that rural, um, dirt roads kind yes. of of life that I can just read her books and and live them. I can see it all. I can I can find them. And she's, um, and she's very she's very sneaky because you start out reading something and you go, well, this is very mundane and there's not much going on here. And by the end of that story, you say to yourself, I know people exactly like that. Like exactly <laughs> like that, you know? And that happens to me so much when I'm reading her stuff. Yes. No. And so yeah um I try to read a short story each <laughs> my reading pile, but I try to for myself read that short story every day as Bradbury suggested because you get the whole story there. You're not it it just stays with you all day. And it mm -hmm. it it sort of centers your mind and balances it to other worlds than yeah. you know, um yeah. yelling and and carrying on as people like to do. <laughs> I could just this is this is the point. Why what do you you said that um your okay. No, I know what we need to do. We need to find out where we can get your books, where we can I have your your um website running across the bottom here, but for people who can't see, basically search Brad Smith's books on any engine and his website will come out. Up where at most at all of the yeah i think the typical I, I always say you know support the indies as much as you can uh there seems to be fewer and fewer indies um but if you have a good independent bookstore near you if they don't have my books they can definitely get them um and that's true about indigos and chapters and every place and in the u.s the same i'm i'm not i can't name any independent bookstores in the U.S. because I'm living in Canada, but, you know, Barnes and Noble and whomever, where are you going to find them at? Are you, have you been in any of the local libraries? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've done a few events, actually, uh, over the years. I haven't, I did a, a one book called them event in uh, Dunville last fall, um, but I, that was, I haven't done one recently. Well, because of COVID, basically, I guess everything. Yeah, everything got down. slowed down, and it's, it's yeah. starting. Um, and and then we got old and just wanted to stay home. But <laughs> 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 it just happened during COVID. It's amazing. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, people can also suggest to their libraries to get books in. Yeah. And yeah. and um, I think. Yeah, I think you should be suggested. I'm gonna go check it out. I didn't, I didn't check out our local one, but yes, you can get him pretty much anywhere you can get books. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And some, and, I mean, when 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 your book comes out, it's gonna it's gonna be more prominently displayed. But after a year or two, it gets shuttled, you know, because there are so many books out there nowadays. There's more books being written than ever, you know, because of you know independent publishing and stuff like that. So. You might have to look a bit after a year or two to find them, but yeah, uh, most of them are available. My my three Virgil Kane books are available, so. And yeah, so so you may have to go against um, Brad's sensitivities <laughs> and order them. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he'll mind if it's his books you're ordering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not going to complain. And so when I know there's no exact date and it has to go through a lots of different things and stuff, but any idea when you'll be done? Well, both books, but I'm um, the, the Moose Jaw book. That one's going to be finished first, isn't it? No. Uh, no? The political book is finished and it's coming out next fall. It's with okay. uh, Wol Wolsack and Wynn out of Hamilton. Yeah. Okay. Which is a, okay. Which is a, a great press. This will be my first book I've done with them, uh, Wolsack and Wynn. Yeah. And the Moose Jaw, the Moose Jaw book, I hope to finish sometime this year. I'm, I'm, I'm just working on the first draft now. I'm just kind of getting into it. I'm about, uh, I'm close to halfway through a first draft. So, okay. Well, I am looking forward to those. And if, see, this is the point. The interviewer is not supposed to talk very much, but I want to talk to Brad a lot. <laughs> 
<laughs> the, other, the other place about getting the books is the two that we talked about today, Copperhead Road and Goliath Run are available from uh, At Bay Press, which is in Winnipeg. And you can you can Google them, but they, they, have, they have them open bookstores anyway, but it's at, at Bay Press. And they look like they have a lot of good, a lineup of, of books. There's a few yeah, in them. Yeah, yeah, they're an ambitious uh, young publishing house. Yeah. So, okay. So this is, this is our time up, Brad. Um, I would love to read some more books and have you back to talk about them if you enjoyed your time. Like, this, yes, and absolutely. you, you have a great reading taste. <laughs> 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 so what thank if, you. What, what if I made that up and I really didn't like Steinbeck at all? I just made that up. <laughs> no, just because you said it first. Yeah, See, I, <laughs> I, I, I read the book. And I thought, oh, this guy, because there's a feel, right? Like there's a feel in this a Steinbeck book and Alice Munro or whatever. But I thought Robin Hood, <laughs> I thought Steinbeck. But I don't bring it up because I think I'm crazy most of the time. <laughs> and then I look at your press stuff and and it's like, <laughs> you know, he says he'll always be a Steinbeck fan. And I'm like, okay, so <laughs> there we go. And it's not, you know, people have to understand that's not a copying thing. Or that's not a, it's a, it's a, a way of writing, a method of writing that pulls in certain types of readers, right? Yeah. To be yeah. able to have, I always say people ask, how do I sell in different countries? How do I sell? And I said, I always say it does not matter. What matters is the experience um, because that rural dirt road experience always pulls me in because that's the first thing I remember in life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're and you right. do it well. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Well. So you take care and we'll talk again. And thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Ricky. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. And for the rest of you, I will, I will see you all next week. Until then, may your coffee be hot and your story sweet. Thank you for listening, everyone.